Uh, we'll begin reading down verse 24, Matthew 17. The Bible says, And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free? Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast an hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast, hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. Take that and give unto them for me and thee. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the good testimonies. Thank you for being a God of the big things and a God of the little things. Thank you, Lord, for the God who is a present help in time of need. Thank you for the God who watches over us. Thank you for the God that restoreth the joy of our salvation. And God, even in the most trying of times, you still help your people. Now, Father, I do pray for those that are working with the teens on the other side. You bless our young people. Lord, you'd help them, and I pray those that are working with them, you'd help them. Father, I do pray for those many prayer requests that, God, you'd move on each and every one of them. I pray especially for those that have had loved ones pass away, from that little boy to those that were in that shooting the other night. And God, I pray for those families, Lord, that you, the God of all comfort, will comfort them. And I do pray for any of those families that, have people that do not know Christ, that they'd come to Christ. Now, Father, I pray you'd help us now for the next few minutes. Use this unworthy vessel. I pray the Word of God would come alive in our hearts, and I pray that we'd draw closer to Christ. Lord, bless now as only you can. Thank you for the good singing. Thank you for your goodness, and thank you for your tender mercy. For it's in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus we do pray. Amen and amen. It's just an unusual story. I mean, it's just unusual that there's a fish out there got some money in it, and the Lord knows it, and the Lord sends Peter to catch the very fish that would take care of everything that was needed. Huh? Do you think God doesn't know what you have need of? Do you think God don't know when you need a fish? Hmm? He knows. But I want to look at the verses here and look at the text, and, and we'll... We'll glean from what the text says, and we'll get to the thought I have tonight. I want you to notice the tax. We see in verse number 24, the Bible says, And when they were come into Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? <clears throat> and can I say that this tribute money uh, was a tribute that or a tax that went to the temple. We find that they were seeking to tax those that came into town. Hmm? Uh, I don't know about you, but if I had to pay to go into a town, I probably wouldn't go into it. Huh? But we see the tax. Now notice, if you will, the taxed. Who's being taxed? Look at verse 25. The Bible says, He saith, uh, Yes, and when he was coming to... The house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon, uh, of whom do the kings of earth take custom or tribute, uh, of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free. Now again, the tribute, the tax, uh, was taxes to the temple for atonement. Uh, you came under the umbrella of safety of the temple when you paid a tribute or a tax to it. Uh, now notice, uh, the ones who are taxed, the tax was for strangers. Uh, the children are free. Uh, aren't you glad we've received the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, Aren't you glad we've been made free? The master has set the, free, uh, the slave free. Uh, aren't you glad we are no more strangers? Uh, we uh, at one time uh, uh, were 
strangers. We were strangers to the grace of God. We were sometimes without, but through the blood of Jesus Christ, we've been made nigh. We've been made children of the Lord. We've been adopted into the family of God. We've been made joint heirs to the throne of Christ. We see the tax. We see the taxed. Now notice the taxing. Look with me, if you will, verse 27. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast an hook, take up the fish, the first that cometh up. When thou hast opened his mouth, uh, thou shalt find a piece of money, take that and give unto them for me and thee. Now we see the taxi. Let me just say this. Jesus could have very, just very easily just said, okay, and taken a rock and made it to gold. He could have easily said, boom, and there it was. But he didn't do that. He made Peter work for the piece of money. Peter had to go and cast a hook, take up the fish, reach down in that slimy booger and pull out the piece of money. Hmm? He said, take that piece of money, go take it and pay for me and thee. Hmm? He made him work for it. It's an amazing thing. I wrote a note uh, 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 that God paid Peter's tribute because he worked or he fished for it. Hmm? The Bible says this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Hmm? In 1 Timothy 5, 8, the Bible says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, uh, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Can I say we live in a day and age uh, where people are trying to get out of work? But can I say uh, throughout the Bible, God expected his people to work? Hmm. Uh, I, I get kind of vexed every now and then when I listen to so-called preachers and they'll say salvation is free. It costs God everything. And what Jesus did on Calvary was work. Uh, matter of fact, Jesus' entire ministry, he worked. And he set a precedence for us. My wife was telling me about a, a, a lady doctor she knows of when, when she got her doctor's uh, uh, degree and became a doctor. Her husband quit work. Miss Ned asked this lady not long ago, did your ever, husband ever get another job? Nope, he's a bum. That's what she said. Huh? Uh, heaven help you fellas if you make your wife work and you wouldn't work. The Bible says you're worse than an infidel. Uh, I know work is a four-letter word. And I know if we all preferred we would like to be filthy rich and not have to work. But then all you're going to do is get stiff and die. You got to stay active. Huh? I see this message going to go over real good tonight. I got to thinking about Jesus made Peter work to pay that tax. And I want to preach on this thought for just a few minutes tonight, since you all aren't with me already. I want to preach on the work of a Christian. The work of a Christian. Again, the Bible says if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Let me help you something. America may have a welfare system, but God doesn't. There is no spiritual welfare. Hmm? God expects something in return for our salvation. When He paid for our sins, and He did. And by the way, you cannot work for your salvation. There are religions that teach you you've got to do certain things in order to get to go to heaven. 
My dear friend, the work's already been done. The work was done on Calvary. Uh, Jesus paid our sin debt uh, because we could never earn God's favor. Uh, the only one that could earn God's favor was His only begotten Son. Uh, and Jesus Christ appeased the wrath of God. Uh, and Jesus died for our sins uh, and made a way where every sinner could be saved and go to heaven. If we lived a thousand lives and worked every day of our lives to please God, we couldn't buy one gold brick in the streets of glory. Because there is nothing we can do to impress God. Miss Fedora talked about a rainbow. You think we can impress God? He throws rainbows out there. He tells the sun when to rise and when to set. Uh, it's the one that creates everything that's beautiful. He creates the lily. He creates it all. God does it all. You think we can impress God? Uh, no. But because we are saved, God expects us to work. I do not work to get saved. Brother Adrian said this Wednesday night, I work because I am saved. But there is a work for Christians to do. And somewhere along the line, uh, Christians have gotten lazy. We've gotten to where we think, well, I'm saved and nothing else matters. To who? Right. Not to God. God expects us to work in order to please Him. And I got to thinking about the work of Christians. I was reading this and got to thinking Peter had to go work for that fish. God expects us to work. He doesn't bless us because we work. He blesses us because He loves us. But He desires us to work so that we can please Him. Let me give you the work of a Christian. Can I say, first of all, Jesus said this. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said in John 9, 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. If Jesus had to work, don't you and I have to work? Uh, so let me give you the works of a Christian. Could I say, first of all, there's the work of planting. God expects us to plant. Uh, anybody grow a garden? Two of you, three of you. Four of you, five of you, more of you growing gardens. All right, what a blessing. Let me ask you a question. Do you decide one day I'm going to have a garden, just get out there and start looking at your ground, expecting something to come up? No. If you don't put seed in the ground, you're not going to have any kind of vegetables or, or, or anything come up out of the ground. Right. And by the way, when you put seed in the ground, that's just starting. You've got to constantly keep the weeds out of that thing. You've got to constantly work that garden if you want anything to come from that garden. Uh, can I say, the Lord, He expects you and I to be involved in the work of planting. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 3, And He spake many parables unto them, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. We've been blessed with the greatest seed ever known to man, the Word of God. And God expects us to plant this precious seed uh, in this old world uh, in order for it to produce fruit. Uh, Mark 16, 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world uh, and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, Paul went on to say this in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Paul said, I'm the one that put the seed of the Word of God in some people. Then Apollos came behind me, and he continued to use the Word of God, which watered it, but it's God that gives the increase. Hey, if there's going to be any fruit, that's God's business. But our business is to do the planning uh, give God an opportunity to do work uh, John 4 35 says this say ye not that there are yet four months and then cometh harvest uh, behold I say unto you lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they white already to harvest uh, and he that reapeth receiveth wages uh, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal uh, uh, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together there will be no reaping if there isn't any sowing I'm reminded of the book of Haggai says, Why is there yet seed in the barn? 
What good does it do us to have all these gospel tracts laying around here if we don't get them out into the field? Uh, God help us. I know what the mentality is a lot of folks. Well, we give our tithes and offerings. That helps support missionaries. That helps buy the tracks. That's all I'm responsible for. Show me chapter and verse on that. Right. Yes, supporting missions gets seed in parts of the world we can't go. But what are we doing in our neighborhoods? What are we doing in our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria? Hmm? Uh God help us. There is the work of planning. By the way, that takes work. You got to overcome your inhibitions, your fears, your excuses, and you plant seed. I'm thankful for those that come out on Monday night and plant seed. I'm thankful for those that take out pocketfuls of tracks and they plant seed. They go through a drive through and they plant some seed. Uh, they, they plant seed on the job. They plant seed in the neighborhood. They plant seed in their families. Thanks the Lord. Thanks be unto the Lord for those who do the work of planting. Because without any planting, there is no reaping. You know why a lot of churches are drying up all across this country? They haven't planted. Hmm? They haven't planted. I'll never forget, I had been pastor here two weeks. I said, we're going to go out. We're going to start knocking on doors. We're going to invite folks to come. I found some, a bo little box of dusty tracks in the back of one of the back rooms over there. So we're going to go get these tracks out. And somebody said, well, we did that one time, didn't see any fruit. I said, I don't care. I said, we're going because God said, go ye. He commanded us to go. We're going. Yeah. Uh, and we've been doing it ever since. Some of you are here because somebody planted. Hmm? You say, well, I, I didn't get saved here. Yeah, but God knew you needed to be here. And because people were faithful to plant, God was faithful to send you here. We're glad you're here, but I'm certainly glad people were planting. And by the way, the buck will stop here unless we keep planting. Uh, travel across the country. Uh, get to certain towns and you can tell a, a building at once was a church house and now it's an office building now it's an architectural building now it's a museum now it's a library they're turning our churches into museums because people quit planting mm. uh, churches are becoming dinosaurs because people stop planting thank you for those that plant keep on planting say well I haven't done much planting well get at it it's work. It's work. There's a payday someday, R.G. Lee preached. One of these days when we get to glory, you'll be glad you planted some seed. huh? We'll see what God did with it all. There's the work of planting. Anybody ever hear that story of Johnny Appleseed? I don't know if he wore a, tent, you know, a pot on his head or not. I don't know. But they say he went all up and down the East Coast planting apple seeds, just throwing apple seeds everywhere, and there's apple trees everywhere. Huh? Those of you who like apples ought to be thankful for Johnny Appleseed. Huh? Huh? I'm thankful for those that plant. There's the work of planting. I told you I wasn't going to like this message. If you didn't like that point, you're, you, you're going to really buck out right here. Huh? It's not only the work of planting, there's the work of personal holiness. Can I say it's work keeping yourself unspotted? in this world hmm? can I say you can be minding your own business you can be praying you can be reading your Bible you can be going to church you can be paying your tithes you can be planting seed and if you're not careful you can step in a mud puddle hmm? uh, it takes work to keep your life holy before the Lord Romans chapter 12 verse number 1 says this say uh, uh, the Bible says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Lord. It is our reasonable service to present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy, before the Lord. I've heard people say, I'm willing to die for God. No, you're not, because you don't even live for Him. By the way, he don't want you to die for him. His son died for him that you and I might have life and that we might have life more abundantly. He desires for us to live for him 
And he desires for us and it pleases him when we live a holy life. Uh, 1 Peter 1.15 says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Right. Now here's the problem. That sounds real good. But see, when we think of holy, we think of absolute purity. We know the only one that is holy is God. And how in the world can we be like God? Well, one of these days we will. But the only way man can be holy, I just dealt with this in my Sunday school class last week. Man can only be holy when his heart is conformed to God and his life is regulated by divine precepts. When we give our heart to the Lord and we let the Bible regulate our life, it pleases God, and in God's eyes, we become holy. Amen. We're wrapped in His righteousness. We've been saved by His blood. But when our desires line up with His precepts, and we're conformed to what He sets as the standard in His eyes, we're holy. In this flesh dwelleth no good thing. Right. But when we crucify our flesh to live by His Word, God denotes that as holiness before the Lord because we are seeking to please Him. We allow our will to align with His will. That takes work, friend. Can I say, you don't get holy just reading a chapter a day in the Bible. You get holy when you consume the Bible and then you live what the Bible says. That takes work. That takes dedication. That takes consecration. That takes putting everything else out of your mind and letting God control your mind. That doesn't come easy. Hmm. Uh, has anybody got enough time on your, on your hands? No. So in order to take time to put God first, that pleases God. He knows what you have need of. He knows what you face. He knows your schedule. He knows what you have going on in your life. And when you put all that behind you and put Him first, then He'll enrich all that in your life too. Hmm? Uh, personal holiness that's work. That's where you get to the point where you want to please Him more than anything else. And can I say, most people, they're only interested in their own self-satisfaction. That's why we don't see great revival. Because it's us first and the Lord falling somewhere else. Personal holiness. Personal cleanness personal desire to please God that's work and that's work for a Christian how else is the world going to know what we have is real hmm? so well I'll, I'll I'll dress a certain way all the time well that's a blessing but if your outward appearance is all you've got to hang on you aren't going to help anybody you know why? The Amish have been doing it for centuries. Hmm? Uh, it's heavy in here tonight. Can I lighten things up right now? I'll never forget one time we had a missionary in or a preacher in or something. We dropped him off to hotel. And there was some Amish people there. And Sydney was little. I mean, she was little. She's little, a lot little than you. She's little. And Sydney looks up and says, Look, Mommy, pilgrims. It was one of them Sydney moments in our lives that we won't let her live down, huh? Uh, but hey, their dress distinguishes them. But nothing on their countenance showed me they had any joy. Hmm? And by the way, I was at Walmart one day, and that's a rare thing. 
I like Walmart. Just some of the people in there. Kind of weird. Yeah. Huh? Not the people that work there, Miss Tina. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen some of them people in here think, ooh, where do these people come from? They're not from around here, huh? They ship them in from somewhere. Weirdville. You know what I'm saying? Huh? I'm in Walmart one day, and there's Amish people in there buying eggs. I thought they had their own chickens. <laughs> huh? I thought they didn't have electricity. I thought they didn't drive cars. I thought they didn't have any modern machinery. They don't. But they got to go buy eggs. Huh? I thought this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. One time I was taking Jordan to a debate tournament, and we stopped at a Walmart somewhere, and there was an Amish buggy hooked up to a gas pump. That was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. I thought, what are they doing? Filling the, filling the horse up? What's going on here? Huh? I took a picture of it. I got it somewhere. Huh? But what I'm saying is, you can see people who dress a certain way, that doesn't show joy. Your outward appearance ought to be an extension of what's really going on in your life. And when you have a life that is personally consecrated as a living sacrifice to the Lord, people will see a countenance that they don't see anywhere else. And the countenance, not the clothing, will be what draws people to Christ. Huh? Well, that went over real well, but it's true. I told my wife years ago, I said, you want to know if a man of God's real? Look at his wife. If his wife's an old stick in the mud and ain't smiled in 20 years, Hmm? Amen. A lot of truth to that. Hmm? Uh, so personal holiness is the work of a Christian. Planting is the work of a Christian. Can I say another work of a Christian is prayer. Prayer takes work. Prayer is not bringing a shopping list to God and saying, God, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, and I want it now. Huh? That's what my granddaughter does. She don't even talk yet, but you know what she wants. Uh, and you say, you want a popsicle? Yep. She'll take about two bites, and then she wants something else. And then she wants something else. And then she wants something else. Well, that's how we act towards God. Uh, now, she knows that I'm going to give her whatever she wants. Matter of fact, her mom and daddy know she's going to get whatever she wants. Huh? But that's not how God operates. That's not what prayer is for. Prayer is conforming our mindset to God's mindset. It is a deep, intimate communion with God. Uh, if few ever reach that because we don't spend any time in prayer. Prayer is work. It takes a lot of work to get this old flesh out of the way so you can talk to God. It takes a lot of work to keep your mind focused on the Lord because the devil put wicked thoughts in your mind when you go to pray. Uh, it takes work uh, uh, to make your rotten, stinking, no good flesh uh, spend a few minutes with God. It takes work. Uh, can I say this? Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Paul said, pray without ceasing. Now, how can we pray without ceasing? That is to be in a position where you walk with God so, so intimately that even while you're going through your daily routine, your mind is always in an attitude of prayer. Pray without ceasing. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for, with all, for all the sake. Listen, how can you pray in the spirit that takes work Romans 8 tells us we can get to a point where the spirit itself uh, intercedes with groanings that cannot be uttered you say what are you talking about I'm talking about you get so deeply entrenched with God that the spirit of God takes what is in your heart to God because you can't even put it in words mm. praying in the spirit isn't one of these now I lay me down to sleep prayers it isn't vain repetitions where you babble the same words all the time. It amazes me. You can go to churches all across the country and the pastor is usually going to call within three guys who are going to pray and they're going to pray the same Hey, Everybody knows what they're going to pray because they got it memorized. That's what they're going to pray all the time. But that does not impress God. You know what impresses God? Prayers like we heard this morning. Huh? Praying in the Spirit takes work. 
where you lose sight of you and you realize you're in the presence of God, that'll break you. And you just don't run in and run out and get that kind of prayer. Uh, can I say that like this? He's got a cell phone. Everybody but Joseph. Get that boy's cell phone. Uh, say, well, he's too little. Well, get him one anyway, huh? Uh, I'm trying to help you. You're supposed to say amen right there, okay? Huh? He's like, no, my mama killed me, huh? Uh, I appreciate the Schneckenbergers. They put some, they put some, some good character in their children. Well, we all got phones. Let me ask you this question: How many of you hate to talk on the phone? It's part of my job, but I hate talking on the phone sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Huh? Wasn't it a beautiful thing when you learned how to text? Brother Bob said, "No, it's a good thing. I don't have to talk to Don. I can just say, yep, thumbs up." You know what I'm saying? Huh? She says, I got I got a question. Thumbs up. I get her so confused she forgets the question. Huh? Brother Ray's the worst. Brother Ray will send you some kind of goofy smiley face emoji. It has nothing to do with anything. I'll text him something, he'll send me Santa Claus. I'm like, what? Huh? Somebody teach him how to text. His trifles aren't working. Yeah, good. So does my granddaughter. She knows what she means. I have no idea what she means. But here's the thing. Texting has become its own language. You go to a restaurant and you see people sitting there. They're all on their phones. They're texting one another because they don't know how to speak to one another anymore. Well, that mentality has flown into Christianity to where we think we can almost text God. We just want to shortcut it. We only got so much time. Let's rush in. Let's do this. God, we mean this. We need that. And we just throw it out to God. But my dear friends, that's not speaking with God. That's not communing with God. That certainly isn't praying in the Spirit to God. Can I say prayer takes commitment? Prayer will cost you some things. It'll cost you some time. It'll cost you some effort. It'll cost you. Can I say this? Prayer will conform your will to God's will. Prayer needs a closet. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 6, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now listen, some people take, take everything so literal, they think, do I need to have a closet for prayer? Now listen, I love that movie War Room. If you've got an empty space like that, you can, you can dedicate that space to the Lord. What a blessing. But he doesn't literally mean a closet, but he does mean a specific place to where you can go and shut everything else out. By the way, you cannot be talking to God in your car with your radio blaring. Thank you, Brother Phil. Uh, now, I've been going down the road, and, and I got some good godly music on, and the Lord said, turn the radio off, and the Lord gets to speaking to my heart. Next thing I know, I'm three states away, and I have no idea where in the world I am, or how I got there, or anything, but I've enjoyed the trip. It's me and the Lord's been having a conversation. But listen, he's talking about having a specific place where you can get along with God. Can I say, not only does it need to be a specific place, it needs to be a selfless place. A place where, we, where you enter into that place and you leave yourself out. You, you, you check yourself out and you go in there in the presence of the Lord. You leave all your selfish desires outside. It needs to be a solemn place. A place where you just don't allow anything in there. It needs to be a solemn place, a place where you can get real serious with God. And can I say, it needs to be a satisfying place. It's a place when you come out of there, you're different than when you went in. Now, some people it might be the woods. Some people it might be a specific place in their house or a specific area. Maybe go to a specific park. You've got a place where you can get along with God. 
And I say, you get to that place and you spend some time with God, commune to God, you watch and see if things don't start picking up in your life. But that all takes work. It takes dedication. It takes time. It's work. Work of a Christian. There's the planning work. There's the personal holiness. There's the prayer. And there's also the work of preparation. The work of preparation. I was talking to Brother Adrian. He had no idea I was preaching on this. I believe he said it this way. I heard a preacher preach say that it's a sad thing that people spend more time preparing themselves than preparing their hearts to come to the house of God. Spend more time fixing your hair and getting ready than you do getting ready. We come to church, we look good, but we haven't prepared. We haven't spent time with God before we got here. There's the work of preparation. Can I say we must prepare for worship? That's our problem. We're so used to darting in and out of everything, we've let that happen in church. We dart in and out of restaurants, run through a drive-thru. We dart in and out of the grocery store to pick up something. Dart in and out of the drugstore. Dart in and out of here and in and out of there. And we're running around like crazy picking up stuff and everything. I love my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law will make a list of everything she wants to buy, whether it's a shopping list or something. And rather than go to a place where she can get all that, she'll go to 47 places. She will. She'll go to 47 places. He's pointing at you. She'll go to the Dollar Tree. She'll go over to Kroger. She'll go over to Meyer. She'll go to Walmart. She'll go here. She'll go there. She'll go everywhere. She don't realize... 20 cents she's saving, she spent $40 in gas to get that. Huh? Well, that's just how she does things. Well, that's our mentality with God. We just dart in. And while we're here, we got our minds somewhere else. And then when it's the final amen, we dart out. We continue on with our shopping list of the day. Hmm? God help us to realize we have to prepare for worship. When we have great services, it's because people have been preparing. When we have services that aren't so great, it's because we didn't prepare. We came expecting God to show up. Can I say preparation for worship? We must be spotless. That means we need to be free and clear of anything that will hinder us in our worship. Hmm? I wonder, what's hindering you today? What's got a hold of you today? Hmm? I had no idea he was going to sing that song, but the master, he freed the slave. Well, why have you got something attaching to you that is hindering your worship? Hmm? We've got to be spotless. we also got to be sensitive. Sensitive to when the Lord wants us to say something when He doesn't want us to say something. When He wants us to sing when He doesn't want us to sing. When He wants us to move when He doesn't want us to move. We've got to be sensitive. Can I say that I know our church is unique. I know a lot of churches, they schedule testimony services and they schedule everything. Around here, the Holy Spirit's the one that does the scheduling. But can I say with that comes great responsibility. You expect me to come and be prepared to deliver a message and be prepared to, to moderate the service. Well, did you come prepared? Because whether or not you realize it, the Lord expects you to be prepared, and so do I. There are some times I feel led to have somebody sing. And there are other times I open up the floor to see who has a song because uh, I'm not the Holy Spirit. And sometimes the Lord may say, mm, let them be responsible. Anybody got a song? Because somebody may have something burning in their heart to sing that I would have missed. That comes with personal responsibility. You need to be prepared. Huh? 
you need to be prepared. If the Spirit of God tells you to testify, to stand up and testify. But just because there's liberty to testify doesn't mean that everybody needs to testify. It comes with personal responsibility. We've had those services where God gets to move and folks get to testify. Folks get to bragging on God. God shows up big because He inhabits the praise of His people. And because it's exciting, because God is blessing, because God is moving, somebody will step up and God didn't want them to testify. And it kills the whole service. We must be sensitive. Hmm? Can I say, when I'm standing here asking for testimonies, asking for songs, what I am doing the whole time, I am trying to listen to the Holy Spirit. Because the Lord knows my heart, I always come prepared to preach, but I don't have to preach. Sometimes we have those services where he takes over and he does the preaching. And that's just fine with me. But we have to be sensitive. Got to be spotless. Got to be sensitive. But we also got to be in sync. We got to be in harmony. There's nothing like hearing a family sing that has that family harmony where they hit all the parts and it will bless you, bless you, bless you. We've got to be in harmony. We've got to be in harmony with the saints and with the Spirit of God. Where there is no unity, there is no unction. You've got to be in harmony. You can't worship if you've got an ought with a brother or sister. You can't worship if you, mom and dad, been fighting all the way to church. Huh? Been fighting, have knocked down, drag out, brother Jack, you miss Fedora fighting all the way over here. Huh? And come into church, put on a smile like another one. Huh? Because she picked out that green shirt and you wanted to wear your blue shirt. You know what I'm saying? Huh? You've been married long enough to know what I'm talking about, brother. Huh? You didn't get that gray hair for nothing. You know what I'm saying? Huh? No, nah, I'm just picking on them. Huh? But you know what I'm talking about. If you all had odds and you come into church, that doesn't solve the odds. That would probably grieve the Holy Ghost. Mm. Uh, I'm talking about it's work. Takes work. Takes work, fellas, to say I'm sorry. Amen. Takes work, Colonel, to say yes, dear. Uh huh. You know what I mean? Uh. But also takes work to say yes, Lord. Uh. uh takes preparation for worship. Can I say this? We must prepare to work. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? You're preaching on the work of a Christian. Yeah, you've got to be prepared to work. Hmm? Brother Ray and Brother Ed demolished the old bathrooms. Brother Ray's been working on getting them bathrooms ready. And, you know, because Brother Clint's been holding it for two services now. He's about to die. But Lord willing, tomorrow, 9 o'clock, they're ready for paint, Right? So I'm going to do the painting. Now listen. I now work my focals. I don't paint a straight line, so don't you go in there and make fun of my paint job, all right? Yeah. You make fun of my paint job, I'm going to hand you a paintbrush. Uh, but I'm going to do some painting tomorrow. So you know what that means? That means I'm going to show up, I'm going to have some paint, I'm going to have some roller covers, I'm going to have roller handle going to have roller extension, going to have a paint pan, going to have that little round little tool that takes the paint cap, you know, lid off the paint cans, uh, I'm going to have brushes, uh, I'm going to have tarps, I'm going to have uh, uh, what I need to get that ugly duck board off there that Brother Thad loves, I'm going to put in his office, uh, uh, all that stuff, I'm going to, I'm going to have everything to go to work. We have to prepare to work. In order to prepare for God's work, you've got to make yourself usable and make yourself available. You can have all the talent in the world, but if you don't make yourself available, God's not going to use you. And if you don't make yourself usable by preparing to do whatever God will have you to do, then God's not going to use you. It cracks me up how many people think that you just show up and God just does everything. Brother Phil, how long did you was you a welder? 
43 years. You didn't show up the first day and could run a, a bead on, on, a, on a piece of metal like you did that 43rd year, could you? Took some work, took some preparation, took some training, took some learning, took some getting burnt a couple times, huh? But Jim, you didn't dive as well the first time as you did when you was training divers down there at Gitmo, did you? Took some effort, took some work, had to learn how to use all that equipment, had to learn how to dive, had to learn how to not dive in shallow water and hit your head on something. You know, you had to learn all that. Huh? Can I say the same thing in the Lord's work? You just don't show up and know everything. You just don't show up and can do everything. It takes work. It takes effort. And those that put in the work make themselves usable. God will use them. Hmm. It cracks me up. Some of these young boys will go to camp, and they get down there and get so excited. And by the way, you never make a spiritual decision in the heat of something great like that. You always make a spiritual decision in the fire when God's a really a do something in your midst and in your heart. But these young boys will go down there, and they'll, they'll, there'll be a couple of them will always come back and say, I, I think God wants me, wants me to pray. Wonderful. Do you like to read? Nope. Well, you ain't going to make much of a preacher. Huh? And I, I, I've given a few of them over the years, I've given them book reports. I said, read this book and bring it back to me and give me a report on what this book says. One has come back with a book report. And that's Brother Daniel. He's the one God called to preach. Huh? listen it looks great you get to sit in a congregation and everybody's looking at you and you're up on a platform and you get to chew people out and they shake your hand and tell you they enjoyed it that looks great can I say it takes a lot of work a lot of effort a lot of study it amazes me how some guys will never study and they wonder why God don't use them. In the computer industry, because that was what my first degree was in, when you program a computer, we always had a, a saying, it's called GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. You put garbage in that thing, that's what it's going to spit out. But if you want it to run efficiently, you've got to put the right things in it for it to spit out what you want. It amazes me how many people say, that stupid computer. The computer's just spitting out what you're putting in. If you don't put in the right password, you're not getting in. It's not the computer's fault. Write your password down so you can remember it. Huh? If you don't type in the right commands, it's not going to give you what you're looking for. Well, the same thing with God. If you don't put time and effort in... God's not going to pull it out of you and, and use you in a great capacity. It takes work. It takes preparation. And I say, we must prepare for worship. We must prepare for work, and we must be prepared to withdraw, to go home. Do you know we're all going to give an account of ourselves to the Lord? Are you prepared for that? Heard Raymond Sorrell's preach, Lord have mercy, 30 years ago. You've got to stand before God before you stand before God. See, we all know He's coming. We just don't think He's coming today. But He could. Are you prepared? Hmm. I was never in the military. It's one of the regrets of my life. I was never in the military, but one thing I know, they train, they train, they train, they train, they train, they train, they do it where they could do it in their sleep. They train, they train, they train, they train, they train for the event of war. And the vast majority of men that have served over the years never went to war. But they was all prepared to. We should be prepared to go home. Because he's coming. And are we training? And by the way, that takes work. 
takes work focuses, focusing on the end when you can't see the finish line. But see, we don't know what a day brings forth. There are 6,500 people that went out into eternity while we've had the Bible open. We never know when our number will come up. We need to live like we're going to live forever. But we ought to be prepared as if we're going home today. God help us to put in the work of a Christian. It takes work. It takes effort. But it's worth it. It's worth it when you've labored and prayed and sought the Lord and planted seed and watched somebody walk an aisle that you've been praying for. It's work it, worth it when you see a co-worker trust Christ. It's worth it when you see a family member trust Christ. It's worth it when you see God do something great and answer your prayer, even if it was little in other people's eyes. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it when you face a deep pit, but He's right there with you. It's worth it. It's worth it. But it doesn't come haphazardly. It takes work. God help us to go get the fish that the Lord will use for us and for Him. God help us. Oh, God could do whatever miracle needs to be done. But aren't you glad He chooses to use us to get in on what He's a-doing? Just do the work for the night time cometh when no man work. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Maybe you need to come and ask the Lord what He wants you to do. Maybe He spoke to your heart about some things you should be doing and you're not doing. Maybe tonight you just want to come and thank Him that He uses you at all. Maybe He spoke to you about something totally different. Folks are coming. They're picking out a song. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Oh, Lord, we know that Sometimes we get overwhelmed at the thought that you'd even use somebody like us. And Lord, sometimes we get so busy with other facets of our life that, God, we don't intend for it, but we push you on the back burner. And sometimes, Lord, we're not as sensitive as we should be, and sometimes we're not where we should be. So, God, I pray you'd wink at our ignorance, forgive us of our shortcomings, and help us, Lord, to do the work of a Christian that you might get glory from our lives. Lord, we want to live a life that pleases you because, Lord, we're certainly pleased with the work that you've done in us. Now, Father, I pray you'd meet every need of every heart. You know what's needed tonight, and I pray that folks would just respond accordingly. Speak to hearts. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.